Okay, so uh, in the previous two lectures, we uh, so just to recap what happened. So I started actually giving you, in some sense, the answer to to a particular problem. But the advantage was that this answer is extremely concrete and extremely computable. So we learned by playing with usual calculus uh, some symmetries of graphs, which uh, Again, was brief introduction, if you wish, to three manifolds because they can be labeled by graphs or four manifolds. So we kind of learned this uh, 3D uh, Kirby calculus from concrete results. And uh, advantage of that is that if you are a mathematician and you want to explore the structure of this invariance, uh, basically table one, table two, and table three are actually quite interesting invariants. So they have a lot of structure and um, Many of them are kind of on a cutting edge, so they give you opportunity to study, say, mock modular properties of this Q-series in the last example, or a structure of the somewhat untraditional Tran Simons partition function in, in table one. So, uh, therefore, if I were to summarize it, I would say that uh, first lecture was actually um, not really about calculus, it was about Kirby calculus, so that's where topology comes in. So, second lecture, uh, I spent pretty much all my time talking about physics, and the goal was to clarify why uh, all these three different tables of integrals have exactly the same symmetries, that it's not really an accident that it has physical origin, and my goal was to explain the physical origin, so we were talking about physics. And today, uh, I plan to spend pretty much entire lecture on algebra, or representation theory. So, the subject of this uh, meeting is quantum fields, geometry, and uh, representation theory. So quantum fields is here, geometry is here, and representation theory or algebra is going to be here today in the third lecture. So I want to uh, put this in front of you, this, this diagram, which again, hopefully familiar from different perspectives to uh, physics and uh, physicists and mathematicians. Um, and uh, on the one hand, it summarizes what we discussed before in this nice diagram form. On the other hand, I want to revisit one particular item in this diagram and zoom in on it, on it a little bit closer, uh, because it will give us a useful way to think about uh, the algebraic structure that appears in uh, this physical theory. See, my, one of the points uh, that I mentioned last time is that this uh, six-dimensional origin of this correspondence between three manifolds and physical three-dimensional theories uh, is kind of cool because um, it gives you a QFT-valued topological invariance of three manifolds. So you basically can think of it as a functor from three manifolds to quantum field theories. Problem is that this sounds crazy in part because we don't have a mathematical definition of three-dimensional quantum field theories. So if I really had a full encompassing definition of what this QFT is, I could rephrase it in terms of, say, categories or high structures, uh, but we're pretty far from, from that stage. This theory has a lot of really physical information that goes, for example, into very fine dualities, which was another topic that might be of interest to physicists. So, if I were to try to extract the most algebraic structure that contains in this uh, big package, so that's really the proper name for, for this theory, I would say that when we study this partition function on the Swan cross sigma, we notice something else. Not that it computes some numbers that depend on this choice of sigma, perhaps additional data, but that these uh, numbers are encoded in, in the structure of modular tensor category. So what I want to do now is focus on this particular line and erase everything else, and that's going to be our algebra in the context of three manifolds, and in a second I'm going to generalize it to, or tell you an analogous story for four manifolds. So the proposal is that every three manifold uh, defines quantum field theory, and um, uh, that in turn defines a particular structure, modular tensor category, or labeled by the three manifold and original choice of root system, which for us is always of type or ton type A for, for n5 brains. 
or for corresponding 6D theory. So now, what I'll try to do in this third lecture, as I promised before, uh, I'll try to bypass physics. If you wish, physics is a good intermediate step, and uh, it's a way to compute some things. But mathematicians can view this correspondence now as something that starts in topology, goes through a black box of physics, and spits out something algebraic on the end. So that's going to be the main theme of today. So now, as I promised, for mathematicians, I'm coming back to something reasonable, tangible, but still quite interesting that there'll be a lot of algebraic structure associated to topology. <clears throat> so, I'm not going to describe this MTC of M3 in great detail. I may be able to do this if there are questions uh, in, the, um, in the discussion session, but I'll just say uh, a few words about what it looks like, very roughly. So, if you're a mathematician, you probably care about, for example, a uh, number of simple objects in this uh, MTC. And the set of simple objects here is pretty much the same as set of connected components of complex flat connections on, on a three-manifold. And if you remember, at some point, the um, a billion flat connections, connected components of a space of a billion connections appeared. So that was relevant to one of the lines, namely table three of our integrals. But this MTC actually knows a little bit more, and um, its growth and dip group is, uh, uh, has the same rank as, as uh, this number of components. So that's uh, one property of, of this modular tensor category. Uh, if you want, I can give you a simple example. Uh, say, if uh, our manifold is represented by a graph, as we discussed the other day, uh, then MTC of this particular graph, if you, say, place minus 2 on all vertices, and it has a couple of edges, we discussed similar graphs before, then this is going to be um, MTC associated to very interesting model, so-called three fermion model, in uh, literature on symmetry-protected topological phases. So this is a close cousin to a um, more familiar or um, small variation on so-called uh, toric code model of uh, Alexei Kitaev. So that's an example. And finally, if uh, you still prefer working with uh, numbers or concrete formulae, as we did in, in, in this table two, so what table two produces for you is, given a three-manifold that calculates some partition function of this theory T of M3 on S1 cross sigma, where sigma can be, in principle, any Riemann surface. I had a very specific example in mind, but you can try to compute it more generally. And then, um, existence of this MTC and the richer structure means, first of all, you can generalize this calculation. But second, it also means that this particular calculation can be expressed as sum over states lambda of S and T uh, matrices that are encoding modular transformations in this modular tensor category. So in particular, here is going to be S0 lambda to the power 2 minus 2 p, where S is the S matrix. So what physicists should think, if you never saw a modular tensor category before, you should think that it's some gadget that carries information about S and T matrices. And in particular, if you know S and T matrices, then you can compute partition functions on S1 cross sigma or slightly more general vibrations of S1 over sigma. And they can be expressed as various traces on sums of matrix elements of S and T. So basically the statement is that given a three-manifold, or in fact more generally any three-dimensional n equals two theory, there is uh, such a modular tensor category and um, it gives you S and T matrices. Yeah. That's a great question. So uh, thank you for that. So natural question to ask is, uh, do they have some relation to CFTs or vertex operator algebras? 
because MTC is often appear as uh, representation categories of vertex operator algebras, and that's going to be our next subject. In fact, it will nicely uh, fit into the reason I'm emphasizing this, it will be actually used in construction uh, at the next level. Okay, so my next goal is basically to... Uh, so if, if I were to say, uh, try to attempt some mathematical definition of what this black box, physics black box is, I could capitalize on any of these computable invariants, but probably my favorite would be this one. Even though it's uh, perhaps somewhat less studied than the, than the other ones, it behaves really nicely, and it actually fits in many different places in our discussion. Okay. So now, this, this being said, what we're going to do today is essentially repeat this entire story, uh, and it's good that we had a little bit of training with the three manifolds, when I replace a three manifold by a four manifold. So that's going to be uh, next obvious step. So I'm going to have the same six-dimensional starting point, which probably is relevant for physicists, but not so much for mathematicians. I'm going to compactify that on a four-manifold, and a simple algebra that six minus four is equal to two tells me that if I take out four dimensions out of six and, and um, use them for a four-manifold, the result will be some two-dimensional conformal field theory. And now we're actually getting in business because two-dimensional conformal field theories do have nice mathematical definition in terms of vertex separator algebras, and uh, we're going to be there just in a second. So here, in the previous story, topological twist along the curved manifold did eat up a lot of supersymmetry, so we ended up only with n equals 2 in three dimensions. Corresponding statement in two dimensions will be that it's 0, 0,2 supersymmetric conformal field theory. It's a simple calculation to see that's the supersymmetry preserved. Namely, it's uh, non-supersymmetric, that's the zero, in the left-moving holomorphic sector, and it's n equals two supersymmetric in the right-moving anti-holomorphic sector. So this theory is traditionally called uh, T of M4, or if you want to be pedantic and emphasize the root system, T of M4 comma G, that's a standard notation. And just as before, there are certain symmetries of cutting and gluing four manifolds that we're going to discuss that represent themselves as dualities of this theory, T of M4 um, or T of M4 comma G. Now, just as before, uh, you could imagine taking various quantities uh, or asking various questions in this framework in, uh, associated to, the, to this theory. And um, they, they'll let you in, in very specific characteristics, but if this whole theory is topological invariant of a four-manifold, then anything you ask about this theory should also be topological invariant of a four-manifold, and our goal will be to see this concretely in, in specific examples. So one simple question I guess you can ask is, what is the central charge? So if you have a conformal theory, that's one of the obvious questions. And uh, central charge. So the question is, uh, what kind of topological? It's a number. So if it's topological invariant, what kind of number it is? That's, that's one obvious question. Uh, you can compute a so-called elliptic genus. of this uh, zero two theory. It has sufficient supersymmetry to have a torus uh, partition function. So this is partition function on T2, holomorphic partition function. And um, another question is, uh, what's the resulting Q series? It depends on holomorphic part or on complex structure of these two torus, uh, tau. So you can write it as a Q series, and it's going to be kind of similar to this Z hat that, that, that we saw before. And finally, you can, um, or perhaps not finally, but it's one of the things you can do. Uh, you can, actually, let, let me reserve this uh, for uh, analogous computation. This is a particular partition function on torus. Uh, but what uh, conformal field theory in two dimensions is all about is a structure of correlation functions. And you can consider analogous uh, chiral correlators 
on various uh, Riemann surfaces sigma. For example, you can consider some plane with a bunch of insertions of various operators and ask what that computes for you. Again, it should be some topological invariant. And uh, finally, I was aiming at uh, taking Kuko homology, namely looking at a uh, chiral ring of this, uh, this theory by asking uh, for operators which are annihilated by right-moving supercharge, but not necessarily Q-exact. So, uh, Kuko homology produces something that basically wants to see it in the ground state of the right-moving sector and uh, can be anything in the left-moving sector because uh, this part is non-supersymmetric. So, without uh, too much anticipation, I'm going to say that uh, this Kuko homology operation, or kind of focusing on the left-moving sector, gives you a vertex operator algebra because it's essentially chiral CFT, and chiral CFT is by definition a vertex operator algebra. So that's what I'm going to call VOA of M4, or again, if you want to be a more pedantic, VOA of M4, comma G, but I'll assume that this G is fixed uh, implicitly most of the time. Okay. So therefore, the goal for physicists becomes to identify this two-dimensional zero-two theory. It's, it's an interesting question. This theory exists. You can just start in six dimensions, perform this toy colored Klein reduction, and ask, what, what kind of theory do I get? That's, that's a nice exercise. Uh, sometimes for simple G, it's easier. For hard, more interesting G, it's harder. But this theory exists, regardless whether we like it or not. And then the question is, uh, how much information can we extract? Um, or how much physics can we learn? So that's a good question for physicists. Yeah. Um, they're closely related, but here I mean, uh, typically I mean some number. So what I have in mind is that this picture for me equals really correlation function of various operators inserted at various points. So it's, it, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's contained, it's uh, close, exactly. So that's why, in fact, I was initially trying to draw one arrow, but then realized it's probably split it a little bit. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so mathematically, uh, so my focus today is going to be this object, this vertex operator algebra, VOA of M4. And again, it's a close cousin of modular tensor category that I'm going to erase in the case of three manifolds. And uh, they, of course, talk to each other when four manifold happens to have a boundary. So the question of how the two are related will appear when four manifold has a boundary M3. And we already encountered such situation precisely in way of constructing manifolds from graphs. So that's going to be my universe uh, of, say, three manifolds or four manifolds. But of course, uh, the story is more general, so sometimes I may even venture out of it. Before I proceed describing uh, various properties of this vertex operator algebra and perhaps even the physical theory, um, by physical theory, I'll always refer to T of M4, and its chiral sector will be this VOA of M4. So before I go into that, it may make sense to uh, give a clarification on what this VOA of M4 could be for mathematicians. So from the mathematical standpoint, uh, this compactification probably does not make too much sense, unless you're really willing to think of a fiber puffing. But the OA of M4 is answering a very concrete question as well in, in the world of math. Namely, you can try to study moduli spaces of instantons for group G on your form manifold M4 and take its cohomology and uh, ask what kind of algebraic structure acts on, on, this, on this space. So let me denote the space by V. So this is going to be some vector space V, and if I have arbitrary instanton number, it's, it's humongous. 
It's, it's an infinite dimensional space, and I can ask what kind of algebraic structure is acting on the space. That's a reasonable question. Mathematicians, in fact, have up this question. And um, Kojima answered this question in uh, 1994 when he considered four manifold of the following type. It's a linear graph in our notation with all the labels being minus two. Okay. So such manifold is sometimes called A sub n minus one if there are, uh, let's see, n minus one vertices. And then a uh, corresponding answer was that in this case, VOA of this manifold A sub n minus one is actually uh, a fine Katz-Moody algebra of type SL little n at level capital N. Okay. So this was a prototypical example for many later attempts, including uh, AGT correspondence, which gives an answer for, so AGT uh, is another classical example uh, for four manifold, which is basically R4, but R4 viewed equivariantly, uh, just like in this vortex partition function that I was writing uh, in the case of three manifolds. Capital N is still on the board. Uh, st that N, yeah, yeah, that N. Right. So, therefore, what this VOA from 4 trying to get at is answer the question, what algebraic structure acts on instanton moduli spaces? And um, that's, in general, pretty hard to answer, in part because these moduli spaces are horrible. In particular, if you really take it at the face value, they are actually very sensitive to the metric. So you expect something topological, but this space is extremely sensitive to the metric. You can, yes. Correct, yes. It's uh, basically LE space or better resolution of uh, AD type singularity of type A. So then you can slightly improve the situation by trying to uh, invent a slightly better moduli space. For example, if you think about this problem, and in particular the storage partition function and this whole setup, you may think that Waffer-Witten moduli space, which is space of solutions to Waffer-Witten equations, is going to be a better candidate. But even that is not ideal. It slightly improved the situation, but it's not perfect. And again, there are several iterations. I can tell you the final answer uh, to which you I mean, we, to which problem you can associate this VOA from 4. Morally, what it's trying to do, it's trying to make sense of, of this statement, and that's where this point of view of first compactifying on a 4-manifold, analyzing this two-dimensional theory, can actually help in mathematics to properly resolve singularities and compactify something that's uh, hard to analyze from the analysis viewpoint. And if I have time, I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So that's the mathematical question. So there are two questions that this VOA from 4 is trying to answer. Physical question is, what is the chiral sector of compactification? And the other one is, uh, what, is the, um, what is the algebraic structure that acts on moduli spaces of instant time? Right, so why, why, why the two are the same? That's, that's actually a very good question. Um, the two are the same because of the following. So if you consider this uh, theory of five brains on um, T2 cross uh, four manifold, and consider two different reductions. First, uh, say, on a four-manifold, then you get a two-dimensional theory, which is our friend T of M4, on, on a two-manifold, on, on, sorry, on T2. 
Okay. Alternatively, so you're actually in, in a situation which uh, aims to compute this elliptic genus. You're actually here. Um, so here you, I can start filling this law to computing chi uh, of Q, the uh, character of that VOA. If you do the other reduction, first compactifying on P2, um, what happens is that uh, you so reduce on T2 first. What you get is 4D n equals 4 super n mils. Uh, this is uh, on, on, on a 4 manifold on, on M4. But now, in order to be defined on a curved space, this theory has to be topologically twisted. And if you think what it is, it's actually waffe witten twist of n equals 4 super n mils. And therefore, you get a statement that this character of this VOA of M4 is nothing but waffe witten partition function of, 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 um, of M4. Okay. So what the statement uh, about the cohomology is trying to ask, is trying to ask for categorification, namely uh, this chi is basically the graded trace, graded by instanton number, and uh, from the viewpoint of VOA, it's, it's graded by L0, uh, the stress energy tensor uh, or conformal dimension eigenvalues. And um, relation between this equality of character and buffer with partition function and, and uh, the VOA and this uh, uh, big module is that it's basically trying to categorify or replace numbers by, by vector spaces and lift uh, the statement to statement about algebra that acts on, on this module. So there are a couple of things I can, uh, in fact, thanks to a question, immediately try to address here. So first of all, uh, I can replace this uh, two torus by any sigma and uh, get some theory of class S on one side, topologically twisted, and here it will be some chiral partition function of a two-dimensional theory on sigma. If we do the following, just like in this previous discussion, what's happening here is that from the viewpoint of four manifold, this theory is fully topological, we use a supersymmetry to perform full topological twist, but along sigma we have some holomorphic twist. Also sometimes called half twist in the language of two-dimensional sigma models with zero two supersymmetry. And remember I told you before that the six-dimensional story um, does not admit full six-dimensional twist, and what's written on the board here is really the strongest you can hope for. So it's fully topological in four dimensions, but it's only holomorphic in the remaining two. And that's the best you can get. You cannot get rid of Z-dependence, holomorphic dependence in two dimensions, but in some sense, that's pretty cool. It's good that it'll, it's precisely where this chiral or holomorphic structure encoded by VOA correlators uh, is going to be useful for us. So it's going to be pretty rich structure. And another generalization I can and should probably make immediately is that, uh, like here, I mentioned that in general it's natural to consider four manifolds bounded by three manifolds. And if so, you should pick uh, some boundary conditions. And the natural choice of boundary conditions for waffe witten theory is precisely uh, a choice of complex flat connection on a three manifold MP, and that's where this MTC and our previous discussion will come in very handy. And uh, this label row will basically appear everywhere. So if you study, say, moduli spaces, you have to specify the boundary condition row. Um, and therefore, what you get is not just a single infinite dimensional vector space, but set of them labeled by row. And this will be uh, various modules of VOA of M4 and corresponding characters will be waffe witten partition functions on a four-manifold with boundary. 
the unsuitable boundary condition. Okay, any questions? So there are several pieces of information that uh, are usually available pretty much on any four manifold that can help us if we don't have any other way to get this uh, theory, two-dimensional theory for corresponding vertex algebra. There are at least three useful tools that you can keep in mind. Uh, one is central charge, which is extremely helpful. We're going to discuss it in a second. And if you're aiming to get some chiral CFT or, or two-dimensional full CFT with left and right sector, that's a basic information that we want to have. We want to know, roughly speaking, what's the central charge. That's a basic characterization. Slightly more uh, useful information, in case if a ma manifold has boundary, is uh, this modular tensor category for the boundary. Because if it happens that 4-manifold bound is bounded by M3, then this will always be a subcategory in a representation category of this VOA of M4. And therefore, if you know something about this, it gives you a little bit of a constraint about uh, VOA or modules of M4. That's also information that's fairly computable. And in the increasing degree of complexity, uh, if you happen to know Waffer Witten partition function of your theory, perhaps again, if you have boundary conditions with boundary conditions, then it gives you information about characters, not just how many modules you have or how they behave, but real characters. But unfortunately, this is really hard to compute, so I listed it in an increasing degree of complexity. The, co the computation of Waffer Witten partition function is currently available only on complex surfaces, and interesting questions about four manifolds way outside of Keller surfaces where this is typically done. So, but there is ongoing work by uh, many people, including, say, uh, Gotcha, Toda, and um, uh, Richard Thomas, and various others, uh, of, of trying to compute the forbidden partition function for many manifolds. They do run into exactly the same issues of how to compactify moduli spaces, what really to take as, as a definition, it's, it's a very challenging problem whose glimpse we may see today. Uh, but in, in fact, sometimes they even get different answers for color surfaces, but that's precisely what physics, perhaps this alternative route via uh, first getting the algebra, may, may be very helpful. Yeah. This is what? Uh, if you want me to, so yeah, it's, it's a separate discussion. I ventured into it a little bit, so I'm not going to say more now, but I'm happy to discuss it in the discussion section. It, it, will, it, it will take quite a bit to formulate it and, uh, um, yeah. But it's, it's in the paper, so you can, you can also look up there. Okay, so I'll actually go to now simpler things uh, and first try to address the question of, for example, what's the central charge? Of the, so that was one of the first items. So I'll try to tell you first what the central charge of this... Uh, of this VOA is. Um, by the way, perhaps I should, before I proceed, I should also say that just to give complete uh, table, uh, I tell you kind of uh, um, yeah, I already said what, what the character of the modules uh, for this VOA uh, gives. It gives uh, Waffer Witten partition function. Uh, central charge we'll discuss in a second. It has to be some topological invariant of a four manifold, but I'll say here that uh, correlators 
of a particular type, there are many of them, but certain of them, uh, encode uh, cyberquitan and Donaldson invariants. of M4, of a 4-manifold. And uh, the reason I say this is because, just to make sure that this VOA is not entirely boring or trivial, because it could have been that it's, uh, it's an invariant, just like many other things we discussed, but it's uh, very uninteresting. This is not the case. You can recover Donaldson and Cyberquitan invariant as correlators in this VOA, so it's, it's more interesting, because it contains all this information and probably something else. And once I am at it, I should probably say why this is interesting to four-manifold people. Because four-manifolds, unlike three-manifolds, are not classified. And we're talking about the smooth ones. So we don't know complete or actually good invariants of manifolds. So one particular operation that illustrates how bad uh, the situation is, and current situation really is, based on this Cyberquitan and Donaldson invariants, they are equivalent conjecturally, and everything else that people studied boils down to Cyberquitan invariants, unfortunately, so that's all we have. But see, the problem is, and it's very easy to see where uh, this problem comes from, if you take two four-manifolds, M4, say, plus, and M4 minus, these are closed four-manifolds, take your favorite K3 surface, would do, uh, ask that B2 plus uh, of each one of them, M4 plus minus is uh, bigger than one, so K3 surface indeed is a good candidate, or anything else you like, or recover surface if you wish. Uh, consider connected sum of these four manifolds. That's a basic operation which does the following. It takes a little ball from each one of them, so if you have one, M4 plus, and another one, M4 minus, then remove a small ball from each one. It creates uh, a boundary, which is a three-sphere, and re-glue it back. So that's operation, very simple to visualize, called connected sum. Theorem, which actually goes back and is in the original work of Donaldson, is that Donaldson invariants for such connected sum vanish, and there is a simple analogous theorem that says cyberquitan invariants vanish. So therefore, our most powerful invariants on the market are completely blind to the most trivial operation on four manifolds. So that's how desperate we are to find something new. So analogous statement in the context of this VOA is going to be <coughs> that VOA of connected sum is simply a tensor product. It's the simplest operation on vertex algebras that you could possibly imagine. So VOA, if you apply it to the same procedure of M4 plus uh, connected sum M4 minus is going to be basically VOA of M4 plus tensored with VOA vertex algebra of M4 minus. And that's not only natural, but it comes from the fact, it's actually easy to trace to this moduli spaces, because here the vanishing comes from a very stupid reason. So you have moduli spaces of, say, instantons or whatever their proper replacement on both components, and when you take this connected sum, uh, there is in moduli space a certain circle that basically kills you when you try to take a characteristic, when you try to compute the number. So the spaces actually are quite rich when you take the connected sum. But when you try to kind of compute the number, that's what gives zero. So the point here is to try to categorify it, or rather work with something, with vector spaces or homologies, rather than numbers. And that's precisely what this uh, thing is trying to achieve. Okay. So that's why this is interesting. That's why um, th this is also why we have limitation in terms of Cyberquitan and Donaldson invariants, but now I'll go back and try to, again, describe for you some properties of, of this uh, theory and corresponding vertex separator. Any questions? So physics actually is very useful 
namely this route uh, of, of physics, uh, is useful because it quickly gives you a way to determine central charge from the corresponding conformal anomaly in six dimensions. So central charge is controlled by anomalies, which uh, do integrate over the fiber, just like usual characteristic classes. And that allows you to determine the values of C left and C right. There are, in principle, different central charges. And uh, if you want a sample of how it looks like for G, which is SU2, and like everything in my lecture is, is going to be limited to, to rank one, uh, here is the table. I'll give you simple examples of four manifolds and uh, corresponding values of C left and C right. So C left is going to be the actual central charge of V O F M four. It's uh, so this vertex algebra is describing the chiral sector, and uh, C right is going to be the central charge of the uh, right moving part, which is not visible directly to V O F M four. So, for example, for a four sphere, one of the simplest four manifolds, you get uh, here twenty six and twenty seven which you can write uh, suggestively as 2 plus 24 and 3 plus 24. Okay. For CP2, you get three large numbers, 57 and 60. And if this is your first time seeing these numbers, you think that that's probably crazy. It's a conformal theory with very large central charge. So what's good about it? But there is actually a lot of things which are good about it. So. For completeness, if I mention CP2, and I have to be fair to everybody, I have to give you the one for reverse orientation, CP2 bar. And here the values are quite different, 21 and 21. So what's going on? We just reversed orientation, suddenly things change a bit. So S2 crosses 2 gives you 52 and 54. Uh, if you want to consider a more general connected sum, the operation that I just explained a moment ago of m copies of CP2 and, say, n copies of CP2 bar, then the answer will be 26 plus 31m minus 5n. And here it will be similarly 27 plus 33m minus 6n. Okay. So all of these formulas and computations are really easy. They fall very straightforwardly from the fact that we define this theory as, as a reduction of something on, on a four manifold. And finally, if you work with, uh, say, S2 cross some Riemann surface of genus G with n punctures, the answer is going to be uh, 2G plus 4 n plus 1 and here is 6 and plus 1. So these are some sample of examples just to show you how easy and how concrete it can be. Uh, right. So I have to point out that actually general formula that you use to compute these values of central charges actually works best if your manifold, four manifold is generic. Generic means that metric is arbitrarily crazy and does not admit, I mean, the same topology does not admit a metric with a reduced holonomy. Because when reduced holonomy is possible on, on a given manifold, this calculation actually is not reliable. And in fact, this last item here, this one, is not obtained using general formula. So here it's crucial that this manifold is scalar. So holonomy is reduced and there is something subtle going on. So such subtleties, I want to warn you, or present when holonomy is reduced. So even though some of my other examples are also killer, actually everything is fine. So for everything else, the formula can be applied, and you can go through and get your central charges. Uh, for K3, it's uh, 24 and 12. Exactly. That comes from accidental flavor symmetries. So, yes, yes, yeah, some, some mixing, exactly. So if everything is generic, in other words, if in garden variety 0, 2, everything is fine. But as you know very well from this mixing, 
Uh, for example, here, even the supersymmetry is enhanced to 0, 4. And that's, yeah, there is, there is more going on. So I want to warn you that, that if metric is scalar, which is usually nice, like I said, it's actually good for Rick, Thomas, Lotter, Gotchi, and others to do computations of alpha weights and partition functions. That are precisely the cases where they can do calculations because of the Keller structure. Here, in the computation of central chart, this is actually the supple case. And if you're on a generic manifold, such as this connected sum, everything's fine. Exactly, exactly. So modularity of alphabet and partition function is precisely modularity of characters of this VOA of M4 from this point of view. Okay, so, um, right. So therefore, uh, what are these central charges? So the, I gave you the answer for, for SU2. And uh, the general method, which uh, is based on anomalies, basically gives you a formula, a very concrete formula again, which works generically. Uh, for instance, left-moving central charge, which is really relevant to uh, vertex operator algebra, uh, in general can be expressed as uh, 13 chi plus uh, 18 sigma. And you can indeed verify that most of my entries in this table feed this general formula precisely uh, when, when this uh, special delicate phenomena don't happen. So I promised you that every quantity in this uh, two-dimensional conformal field theory is going to be a topological invariant of a four-manifold. So sure, uh, early characteristic and signature are good invariants of a four-manifold, but they're quite classical. This is not very surprising, though, because uh, you do expect that central charges, C-left and C-right, are basic quantities that characterize theory, and early characteristic and signature are indeed basic quantities or topological invariants that characterize four manifold, so it's nice that they sort of match together. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now I could proceed in several different routes, and um, I could, first of all, try to describe various properties of, of this vertex algebra and say some facts about it, such as, again, that character is equal to a within partition function, which I did. I could also try to give you construction of this uh, two-dimensional theory or corresponding vertex algebra in various classes where it's known. So. Uh, that could be construction part of the talk. And then, as we already learned in previous cases, these constructions usually have some kind of relation, such as Roy de Meister moves that Piotr talked about. And uh, they should be represented by equivalences, equivalences of either the full two-dimensional theory, which has right and left sector, or just uh, left-moving chiral Algebra VOA FM4. So I could talk about equivalences. And um, I probably won't have time for everything. So instead, what I'm going to do, I'll basically give you a little sample or say a few words about each topic. So it will be more like a survey or a appetizer or sampler plate. Um, but again, if there are specific questions, I'll be happy to address them in, in a discussion session. Um, good. So, construction and, and equivalences usually come from gluing of various basic pieces of four manifolds, just like you can glue various basic pieces of three manifolds. So, first I want to tell you how the story relates to what we already learned in the previous lecture. So, suppose you have a, three, a four manifold, which is big uh, and contains two pieces, M4 plus and M4 minus, just like in the connected sum operation, except that here I take the general slice to be some M3, not just necessarily a three-sphere, although three-sphere is a perfectly legitimate example. And suppose I want to reduce this uh, picture uh, to two dimensions to obtain T of M4. Um, so how do I do this? Uh, 
imagine stretching this uh, uh, operation or, or gluing operation into long sausage uh, such that uh, in the middle we see M3 cross a real line. And we already talked what happens when you compactify from six dimensions on a three manifold, you get a three dimensional N equals two theory. T of M3, again, for that same choice of root system that, um, that, that specifies the whole picture. So you get such a theory on a real line. So real line for me is going to be uh, this direction. It's the direction of the sausage. And again, the counting is simply that 6 minus 3 is still 3. But now this... Uh, when we try to approach the end or go in this direction, as you can see, we can go only that far to the left and only that far to the right because this geometry is kept off. So what's happening is that as you approach this, uh, this boundary here, this dimension basically stops and the information about M4 minus is encoded in a boundary condition. which we can naturally call T of M4 minus in this case, and uh, T of M4 plus on the other side. And it's a simple calculation to see that just like the whole complete two-dimensional theory that we want to study, they preserve two-dimensional 0 2 supersymmetry, and the entire theory for closed manifold, which is built out of two pieces glued along three manifold, is now represented as a three dimensional theory sandwiched by two boundary conditions. So, this boundary condition and this boundary condition, so that instead of three dimensional translation invariance, it only has two dimensional translation invariance along the boundaries. And this, this direction is broken, so it's 3D theory leaves on interval cross R2. Or interval cross sigma, if I am to keep sigma as part of my notations. Okay. So, in this way, uh, first of all, MTC naturally gets in the game. And secondly, um, if you ask now, how does computation of the elliptic genus <coughs> in this two-dimensional zero-two theory comes about? It has uh, connects very naturally to this index of a coupled two-dimensional, three-dimensional system that I mentioned yesterday. We actually used it in the computation of this invariant z hat from the 3D point of view. So now it applies to the system of 3D n equals two theory with a 2D boundary condition labeled by four manifold. Yeah. Um, that's in some sense Abhijit's dream to <laughs> uh, describe it that way, but um, in principle, I mean, there is M4 plus and M4 minus, they um, yeah, they, 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 there are two manifolds bounded by the same three manifolds. So a priori, uh, I don't want to use any more. Yeah, the... Yes, yes. So therefore, what, what, it, what this M4 minus does, it actually defines a boundary condition in a, th in a theory which is one dimension higher. So what happens is that there is a swap in dimensions. So if you compactify a high dimensional manifold, less dimensions you have left. So that's why it defines a boundary condition. And by itself, it's not, this one is not really a well-defined theory. So it's only a relative kind of theory which can be coupled to, to a theory in one dimension higher. So that's, uh, that's, that's the nature of it. Perhaps I should also mention that uh, in literature on vertex algebras, if there are any experts in the audience, what's really called VOA is usually vertex algebra which doesn't have any fermions. And this story, of course, always does. So this is always, first of all, super VOA 
Also, sometimes in vertex operator algebra literature, you want to emphasize that you have a stress energy tensor by saying conformal DOA. That's yet another adjective. I don't want to use any of these adjectives. Another name for this conformal uh, or non conformal DOA would be just chiral algebra. So I'm encompassing all of them into term DOA, which is also pretty standard. But again, not everybody uses it. So that means that same, same four manifold can be sliced and built out of uh, different sandwiches. Different sandwiches of 3D n equals 2 theories with different sets of boundary conditions. So this is exactly this kind of equivalence that if I had time, it would be verifying that indeed you have same geometry or topology and you cut it in many different ways and it gives you a different description. So that's actually the origin of some of the equivalences, which again, I probably won't really be explaining. So this is an example of uh, gluing. And then you can uh, have analogous story if you have, for example, reverse role of four manifold and three manifold. Namely, you can consider uh, two three manifolds and uh, a cobordism between them. That's also a natural building block. So then, by analogous translation, you would quickly learn that it corresponds to some interface or domain wall between two three-dimensional n equals two theories associated to three manifolds that, that are related by the cobordism. Okay. So now I'm going to give you another example and uh, switch subject a little bit, just again for balance to, to give you kind of survey. Uh, sometimes uh, if I give this kind of talk to topologists, which are really hardcore topologists, which say, yes, we know that Cyberquitten and Donaldson and Varian Svanish are connected some, but we still love them, and can you give us something like that? Why do we have to learn all this algebra? So, here on the board, I still have topology, physics, and algebra. What I love about the story is that they talk to each other. They, they, there is a lot of point of contact, interaction, and it's these bridges which, which I find extremely exciting. So to those people, my first response would be, you're making a huge mistake. If you focus on, say, topology and don't want to learn algebra, they say it's too complicated. I don't want categories, or I have no idea of what vertex algebra is. So, I actually devised to them another response, which I'm going to give you in a second, that even if you don't care, if you really want to study PDEs and do all traditional topology, this vertex algebra will pop up to you whether you want it or not. So you, it's like, again, this T of M4, it's a fact of life. You can love it, you can hate it, but, uh, or you can study it, but it's there, regardless of whether you love or hate it. So, therefore, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to start with the topology problem, and we'll see that VOA emerges uh, kind of automatically. And again, I'm not going to give you all the full details, but I'll sketch hopefully enough that you can see what's going on. And my point will be that uh, it works for general four manifolds, so in this case, there will be no assumption of four manifold, it will be taken absolutely generic. Uh, so that we don't use any special crutches of color geometry or complex geometry. So, let's see, we talked about central charges. We talked about gluing a little bit. Now let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about uh, going from topology to algebra. And typical starting point for topology, as I already mentioned several times, is some set of PDEs. So imagine that you have cyber quitten equations, which in four dimensions look like this. You have gauge field A, uh, spinner psi, section of spin bundle. So a is a connection on line bundle. And uh, let's call it L. And uh, psi is a section 
of spinner bundle tensored, uh, say, with L. And um, the two equations that people usually write, or that Cyber Quitten write, are the following. You have equation that self-dual part of A is square of the spinner, moment map, if you wish, and um, the Dirac equation for the spinner psi. Okay. So if you have such system, then what you usually do, you construct the moduli space of solutions to these equations. You <coughs> It depends, of course, on the choice of a four-manifold M4, but it also depends on choice of topological class of our bundle. So uh, if lambda denotes first churn class of our uh, line bundle L, then it will also depend on lambda. So lambda lives in um, H2 of M4 with integer coefficients. In fact, uh, it's a choice analogous to the choice, uh, what we call B, in the story with three manifolds. So the cyber quitting variant are labeled by something, and uh, that's what they're labeled by in four dimensions, and uh, you saw what they're labeled by in three dimensions. So one constructs this moduli space of solutions. It's convenient to... Uh, yeah, so it's... Uh, yes, thank you. Oh, uh, compare with. Use of B in our pro previous story. So lambda, in fact, I, I maybe should have called it B, but I'm sure I'll f forget because this is fairly standard. So then what you do, you take an uh, integral of um, uh, first chain class of some universal bundle to half dimension of the space, it doesn't matter, it's some characteristic class, top degree characteristic class on this moduli space, and you get a number. So this number you call cyber quit and variant now of a four manifold that depends on lambda, and that's exactly analog of what I told you how to compute in practice in the very first lecture. But for four manifold of the form S1 cross M3. And by the way, everything we said about three manifolds before now can be used very efficiently if you take four manifold to be S1 cross M3. You can basically repurpose our previous discussion and learn immediately uh, the corresponding VOA and so on and so forth. But let me, so this is a standard problem, and this moduli space, uh, what makes it very special compared to, say, Waffa Witten problem or any other problem that you can imagine. Uh, there was no better candidate invent yet that this moduli space is compact. And for generic choice of metric on M4, it's actually nice and um, compact moduli space. It consists of points, in fact, if it's non-trivial. So that's what makes a cyber quitting system special. And for any other problem in gauge theory that people encountered so far, be it Donaldson theory, waffa witten theory, or anything else, moduli spaces are non-compact and badly singular. And we're going to make our story here very complicated in just a second. To make that, what I'm going to do, I'll say that I have not just a single spinner phi, psi, but n copies of them. So i runs from 1 up to n, or rather nf, because n is already reserved. It was used for a number of phi brains. So not to confuse it with that, I'll call this n sub f. And physicists have another reason to do that. So then, I have to impose Dirac equation for each of these spinners and uh, consider now this kind of system. I'm still going to keep you one line bundle. But the problem is that now this moduli space of F monopoles, so-called multi-monopole cyber quitting problem, is completely intractable. It has been studied. This is the simpler system than waffe witten equations or anything you can imagine. But even though it has been studied by Brian Wentworth, Haidit, and uh, Lopuski, and many others, in fact, uh, even Simon, Simon Donaldson, this is hard. The reason is that this moduli space here, this M sub NF of a four manifold with lambda, the way it looks like, it looks like a cone uh, on something with horrible bad singularities of a very stacky nature here in the origin, and, if you wish, various other batches coming out of those singularities. 
So it's singular, stacky, non-compact. How do you define the integral? There is no much help from complex geometry in general, unless you make assumptions on the choice of four manifold, and that's being the, the difficulty. Nevertheless, uh, this problem has an obvious symmetry, and now in the present day, especially the kind of games that we play in physics, suggest an obvious solution. So the way these equations are set up, they're completely invariant under permutation, or in fact any rotation of this uh, spinner's psi. So therefore, what happens is that there is an action of SUNF symmetry in this problem, which descends to the action of SUNF the moduli space. So therefore, even though this moduli space is non-compact, one obvious thing to do if you have this structure is to use it. Namely, to consider not the usual integral, which was useful in the case of cyber invariance, but now equivariant, namely SUNF equivariant version of the integral, it will depend now not only on choice of four manifold and topological class lambda, but it will depend in addition on equivariant parameters for this SUNF. So if I call Z1 and so on, Z and sub F, equivariant parameters, as usual, they leave in uh, Lie algebra of the Cartan of our group, which is SUNF, then we may have a hope to get something sensible if, and that's a big if, the fixed point of this SUNF action are compact. So then we can reduce everything to the usual integral, apply a T-bot localization, and uh, extract the answer. Okay, so that's a sensible problem. Even though this moduli space is non-compact, and again, I can tell you a lot more about geometry and asymptotic behavior, it's actually easy to control. <coughs> Our goal will be to ask, what are the fixed points, and can this integral really be, be taken or made sense of? And the answer turns out to be yes. So the fixed points, S, U, and F fixed points, have co correspond to disjoint union over I running from one up to an F of single monopole, the usual cyber and moduli spaces of the type M4 lambda, and, and as we discussed a moment ago, they are compact, there are quite a few of them, namely if you have an F, say, 50, uh, then, then there'll be 50 copies of pretty much the same thing, but they sit inside the uh, moduli space of, uh, so they, they're contained in this big moduli space of multi-monopole problem. And uh, now, because they're compact, you can actually define this integral, you can make sense of it, so I'll say that SUNF equivariant Integral, so this is a theorem that, based on work with uh, Pavel Putrov and Kola Dedushenko, that this SUNF equivariant integral over M and F of M4, or rather M4 lambda, with a suitable uh, top 
characteristic class. First of all, it boils down to cyber quitan variants. So it knows about cyber quitan variants, and that simply has to do with the fact that a fixed point components are precisely the usual single monopole solutions to these PDEs. So there is a prefactor here, uh, cyber quitan of lambda. But then, most interestingly, we have the structure of a typical chiral correlator of NF points on a plane. So sigma here is a punctured plane. And you can consider points Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on, Z and F. Okay. And even though previously the, in the setup of the problem, the Zs had no real meaning, they were just boring equivariant parameters who lived, on, um, who lived in the Lie algebra of the Cartan, of the group that we're trying to localize with respect to. Uh, even though they started life as something boring, now if you interpret them as positions of the points on, on the plane sigma, uh, what happens is that your result takes form of chiral correlator in the vertex separator algebra precisely that you would find from this compactification of uh, this theory on, on a four manifold from six dimensions, and the answer has uh, the following form. It's one over um, product over j not equal to i in the denominator, um, zj minus zi to the power one eighth lambda score minus sigma, where lambda is our two class, uh, the First turn class of the bundle, sigma is a signature of the four manifold. Uh, you may recognize here the index of the Dirac operator twisted by line bundle L. And it, this is nothing but correlation function of various operators. Uh, we call them S for impurity inserted 10 points Z1 through Z and F. in this algebra, chiral algebra VOA of M4. Okay, so if I had more time, I would actually derive for you this VOA of M4, it's not too hard, and you could compute this chiral correlator and see that it's perfectly consistent, just as promised. But what's cool is that once you have this VOA of M4, once you have this vertex algebra, you can compute its elliptic genus, and of course it will give you waffle witten position function. So the point is that this VOA unifies many different gauge theoretic problems, even if you didn't care about them. So therefore, this is a natural way to argue that topologists should learn, or again, the structure is present in some of their answers, whether they like it or not. And if I had more time, what I would do, I would basically talk to you about equivalences. So that could be another subject of this vertex operator algebras and derive a lesson in the opposite direction that even if you didn't care about uh, topology as an algebraic type of person, people who study vertex algebra say, I have no clue what Kirby calculus are, why, why should I learn them? The point is that if you study equivalences in vertex operator algebras, they would reproduce, just like we saw this coming out of calculus in the basic integrals in lecture one, that uh, Kirby moves emerge and nicely describe various equivalences. But again, that's another topic which I leave for, for some future occasion. Thank you. Yes. So to understand what is understood here as a topological invariant, when you write T of M4, it is a theory which is independent of any decomposition of the manifold and so forth, or it is a class of, equivalence class of theories? Yeah, physical theory is defined as 
super conformal theory in the deep infrared upon compactification from six dimensions on a four manifold. And if it's really topological, you should take, think of it as taking the metric such that four manifold is tiny, very small, so you force uh, the flow across the dimensions from six to two. But it does so, not involve any markings or decomposition of M4. If B2 plus is greater than one, then no. So these Zs which were equivalent parameters, uh, how are they to be interpreted as positions of insertion points? Well, there are, uh, the, the correlation function that you compute in this chiral uh, CFT or involves particular operators inserted, uh, operators that are present in this VOA, inserted at point Z1 and so on and so forth, Z1 through Z. But is there a way to see it uh, from uh, this brain picture? Uh, which picture? I mean, this M5 brain picture. Oh, from the M5 brain picture, basically, yes. Uh, what I'm describing is the sigma is nothing but the cyber quitting curve, actually. But the cyber quitting curve for a problem which has uh, U1 vector multiplet and NF hypers of charge plus one. So uh, these positions, Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on, are uh, singularities on the U-plane, so this, this picture is basically the U-plane, and in the case of NF monopoles, there are NF special points, and that's, that's uh, quite clear that it's something like that should work, because on the one hand, as I described in the beginning, you could do holomorphic twist, compactifying five brain theory on sigma cyber quitin, and get cyber quitin theory on a four manifold, but now I'm basically reversing it, and asking for analogous structure to commute. Uh, I, I had a, probably a dumb question to ask, but uh, when, you talk, when you talk about gluing, uh, is there a way, for example, like instead of slicing off an four with a single uh, M3, which uh, separates it under M4 minus an M4 plus, can one, can, can one consider like an infinite family of M3s which kind of runs along the so-called sausage direction? So you don't have to worry about any M4s as boundary conditions and you just work with M3s? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know much about it. So I think all kinds of gluing are interesting. So I, I am certainly not an expert on all of them and uh, sounds like an interesting possibility. Actually, I was a bit confused by your description of sigma. Isn't it part of the six-dimensional space-time? How can it be the U-plane? Well, here it basically emerges. So here it's uh, emerging geometry uh, from a topology problem. But if you think about it in terms of this T of M4, claim is that indeed you take six-dimensional space-time to be M4 cross the sigma, and you can view it both ways, either compactify on sigma first, if you wish, or do the opposite. So here what I try to do is to, uh, without any uh, knowledge about six dimensions, which explains why this works, uh, to hard-boil skeptics and topology, start with their traditional problem of moduli spaces and basically see that localization forces. So the coolest structure about VOA is this chiral correlator. So that's basically what's coming out of this localization computation. Uh, well, that's, that's basically U-plane um, emerging for, for, uh, for, for, for this multi-monopole problem. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. So here, in, right, so in this case of rank one, there, yeah, there is a one-sheeted cover yeah, of cyber quitting curve over U-plane, yeah. So how much do you actually learn about uh, these VOAs? I mean, their structure, classification, things like that? Uh, so my collaborator, Boris Fagan, has uh, the, this dream that uh, the world of vertex algebras, meaning chiral algebras, not necessarily conformal, and super 
algebras is so wild that, that uh, it may match how wild the world of smooth structures on four manifolds are, or at least there is roughly they're of the same complexity. I'm not sure if how they should be matched. Um, but then it's, it's a good question to actually construct such VOAs for different four manifolds and vice versa. So if you have your favorite four manifold, you can ask what's the corresponding VOA. If you have your favorite VOA, such as Ising model, you can ask what's the corresponding four manifold. And both directions are extremely interesting, so you actually do learn something highly non-trivial about, say, equivalences, for instance, uh, even in first pioneering steps with Apigit and Pavel, we had this triality which relates three different looking VOAs, which are actually the same, or three different, in fact, physical theories. And uh, that came about by looking at uh, what's called handle slide. That's a non-trivial Kirby move in four manifolds version. So uh, in the first lecture, I emphasized that I'm really looking for new dualities. So luckily, they, the topology led us to new dualities both in three dimensions and two dimensions. So you do learn equivalences. And there were, like in the last couple of years of so, those, those papers by Gaiotta as well, they also look at VOAs in some brain systems, which, is there some overlap or intersection with what you are doing? Yeah, there is a connection in case of uh, toric uh, four manifolds. So if your four manifold is toric, it's, it can be encoded by a simple diagram um, like this, for example. And then um, this does overlap with their construction. So uh, in this case, I didn't talk about how you do this gluing. In general, it's done either by extensions or BRST reductions. In, in this particular setup, it would be by extensions. So you can actually, uh, closer connection is uh, to, to work of um, uh, Robchak and Prochaska. So they, they build various vertex algebras from webs. And if you take the web to be the toric skeleton of a four manifold, then it's really the same. Um, so that's one overlap. Uh, there is also an interesting overlap with chiral algebras of um, Beam and uh, Rastelli. If you take, so that's, that's another type of example. You take four manifold to be S2 cross a Riemann surface, uh, they, with simple punctures or non punctures, then it just happens that chiral algebra that they get for class S in their story is exactly the same as uh, this VOA of M4 for this four manifold. And that's kind of interesting because the physical setup is slightly different. So uh, Beam and Rastelli don't have a two sphere. But there is a very nice paper by um, Van Binyan, Pavel Putrov, and, and I'm forgetting some other author who analyzed VOA of M4 for this theory. And they actually compute, sorry, they actually studied full two-dimensional theory, not just VOA, but, but the full T of M4. And chiral sector of this guy happens to be the same as uh, chiral algebra of Beam and Rastelli. So there are interesting overlaps in special cases where four manifold is, uh, has a Riemann surface. There. So what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. So he, yeah, the different four manifold gives rise to different VOA. So I'm saying take take Riemann surface that determines class S, tensor it with S2, compute VOA from four. It's going to be the same as Beam and Rastelli for class S labeled by G and sigma. That's the statement, and it's a true statement. I don't think so. I, I try to think about it. I don't fully understand that because I think so. Physical systems are not related. For example, chiral sectors are exactly the same for for Beam Rastelli and for Pavel and and Van Bean and uh, anyway. Uh, but uh, Rastelli, of course, don't, doesn't don't have the right moving sector, so they, they don't have the CFT, whereas Pavel and company do. So. And moreover, in six dimensions, uh, Pavel and company have a two sphere, whereas Beam and company uh, have um, some kind of omega background of a very strange type. 
So what's happening in some sense is for some reason, uh, BPS sectors with that omega background or topologically twisted S2 happen to be the same. I think that's the closest statement I can make uh, to, to, to true, but I don't understand that. So that's an interesting, Piotr asked me about overlaps and uh, I thought I should be fair to everybody. On unitary, yes. in general, but here as it's following from a phys physical theory, it should just be a unitary with positive central charges and so on? Uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. I was going to mention this, it's a curious topic, it's actually a fun topic, because if you go back uh, to, to, to the table I gave you of central charges, uh, at some point all of them were positive, which, which didn't alarm anybody, but then at some line I said, let's take general number of connected sum of CP2 and CP2 bar, and then that formula minus sign appeared. But what about this? So. Uh, this here be okay. in the story, it quite often happens that, uh, in fact, central charges may be negative, but that doesn't alarm anybody. Or so th there is interesting. Um, Sorry, I mean, if you first compactify on sigma, you get a nice 4D theory classes, and then you compactify on S2, still right. should be but, nice. I mean, just right. so let me try, try to clarify. So what happens is that um, all of the theories. Uh, have something non-compact, they don't have normalizable vacuum. And uh, another thing is that uh, sometimes often you get um, nice looking VOA but with a slightly redefined stress energy tensor. That's a really interesting point, like I said, I was even thinking of, of mentioning it. And as a result, it shifts, it's, it's a nice looking algebra, everything is fine, but it shifts central charge. And in particular, that's the relation between uh, beam Rastelli VOA versus Pavel and Company VOA. It's, it's the same algebra, just stress energy tensor is shifted a little bit by something very boring. And uh, again, the same phenomenon actually appeared when I was mentioning this connected sums. So there were minus signs. Right, right. So that's probably also related to the fact that I don't see direct physics duality, but again, I'm mentioning this just as a curious point that, that uh, the algebras are closely related, and I think uh, it's interesting that groups never cross-reference each other. I don't think they noticed. I asked uh, both members. I think they're all friendly, and it's not because they, they hate each other. They just didn't know. So. <laughs> but I agree, it's, it's a good question, and somebody should elaborate, and the reason I emphasize it, I think that's a good project to, to study the precise connection, maybe localization or something like that. But let's thank Sergey again for a wonderful course. <laughs>